Hello and welcome to Bread and Thread, a podcast about food and domestic history. I'm Liz. And I'm Hazel. We are two friends who studied archaeology together and love social and domestic history and trying things out and experimenting. Um, So we usually start before our main topic by talking about what we've been working on recently um, and what we've been making. So what have you been up to? Um, Well, I continue to be in cable hell. Okay. (laughs) Oh, is this the jumper? Yeah, I'm. I'm getting there. It's just it's very slow progress because it takes like two hours to do four rows because of the amount of cabling. Wow, that's but dedication. I've also started making because I've got a lot of green left over because I bought way too much for my snail rug. Bought too much green. I did. <laughs> um, so I'm making myself a little wizard hat. Because my D&D group is going to all dress up because we have a session the day after Halloween. Oh my goodness. Like it's, It sounds like some people are going to cosplay their characters, which is cool, but I'm the DM. So I'm just going <laughs> to... Sort of generically magical, you know? I can't believe you are not wearing the official D&D Dungeon Master costume. <laughs> I tried to find it. I can't buy it anywhere. Oh no! I genuinely was going to buy it for Halloween this year but I couldn't get it. If anyone has not seen that, please look up Dungeon Master Costume and you'll know which one it is when you see it. Yeah, it's... it's So you can dress up as the Dungeon Master from the cartoon series? <laughs> which is just a whole thing in itself. <laughs> How is the snail rug going? It's going well. I'm... I've done most of the grass because I basically want to do as much as I can on it before I have to move it in the frame. So I've Mm -hmm. done most of the grass and the snail's body and now I'm starting the lettering because it does say effervescent for Tumblr reasons. Amazing. Which I'm doing in hot pink as as a nice contrast. (laughs) So it's going well. I'm emotionally invested in this snail. I mean, it's a growth snail, which is the best kind of snail. <laughs> well, what have you been up to? Um, I finished my vest that I've been making. It is very cute. Um, oh, I will put cool. a picture of that uh, on the Discord. Uh, not the Discord. Um, the Twitter. I mean, you, you put that one on the Discord as well. I could also do that. Yeah. Um, it is very cute. It's just like a little cropped vest that I I spun the wool and dyed it with hibiscus flowers. So it's like a kind of dusty mauve colour. And then I knitted this little vest and it is my first hand spun, hand knitted garment. And I'm very proud of it. And I've been wearing it like all the time <laughs> and being like, hey, do you like my vest? I made it. <laughs> um, yeah. <laughs> so... It's a very good vest. I've seen the pictures on Instagram. <laughs> It it's it is it is enjoyable. Um so yeah, I'm very pleased with that. And um yeah, I've also been just doing some general uh embroidery and stuff. Um and I will be making some um little crocheted creatures, I think, for um my parents are involved with a community forest garden. Um and they do some of the that we have a village market every month um that they have a stall at that they like you know sell the honey from the bees in the garden and stuff and like raise money for um for to get stuff for the garden and buy plants and things like that so um i i decided i would make some stuff for their christmas stall in december so i'm gonna make some little crocheted creatures and insects and things um but hopefully they will be cute um that i can yeah donate for that that sounds very fun yeah and one of them is going to be a snail so snail snap oh snail club <laughs> so um i thought i would talk a little bit today about the milkmaid in popular culture and history okay so i'm going to be talking about dairying but um a little bit more 
from the perspective of like folklore and you know the milkmaid and and why it it's such a thing um yeah i haven't really had time to do like a whole timeline of research or something um like we might normally because i have have just had my first assignment of my course to do um but i thought maybe we could just have a little conversation about some of the tropes related to the milkmaid and um oh definitely yeah I just... mean, this, this is relevant to my interest in a very roundabout way because <laughs> there's um there's a nursery rhyme about edward jenner which talks about milkmaids ah okay so yeah i did i did come across um the edward jenner milkmaid thing but i do not know the rhyme so yeah do you um, shall we um i actually did just want to start by i'm going to send you a couple of pictures and i'll put these up on the twitter as well so that if you're listening you can see them um so the first one that I've sent you, um, you should be able to see now. And then that's the other one. So these are both mm -hmm. paintings of milkmaids. Um, and one of them is an 18th century painting um, by the artist Jean-Baptiste Gros. And one of them is a 19th century painting um, by, hold on, I had it written down. Here we go. One of them is a 19th century painting uh, by the Indian artist Raja Ravi Varma, uh, also of a milkmaid, an Indian milkmaid. Um, so I was thinking at first, you know, maybe this might not be the most relevant subject globally um, due to milk milk consumption, dairy consumption in different areas, but actually India is the world's biggest um, consumer of milk, cow's milk. Um, Interesting. Yeah, um, which actually does make a lot of sense because there's a lot of famous Indian foods that um, and ingredients that are made from cow's milk, for example, ghee or paneer. Um, it's used in a lot of traditional teas. Oh yeah, um, I guess it's, it's just surprising because of the the whole people being able to have milk as an adult is mostly like a Europe thing. Yeah, I think because we associate it with more sort of European and European derived cultures, um, we like globally can kind of forget <laughs> that it's, um, you know, it's, it's also very popular in other areas. Um, mm. And, you know, across the world, if even if cow's milk isn't popular in an area, goat's milk might be, or sheep's milk. Um, so yeah, uh, but I wanted to show you these paintings because they are very similar, actually, despite being of different like subjects from different countries, um, because they're both like. That they're both of you know idealized attractive young girls mm. um who are milkmaids, and that's kind of a thing in popular culture, um like the idea of the milkmaid as like uh an attractive young lady um and particularly um i mean this um the Raja Ravi Varma painting might be a little bit more accurate to maybe what a milkmaid would actually wear. Um, I'm not sure, but the other painting, the 18th century um, French one, is certainly very pastoralist, very idealized. Um, it's, it's very cottagecore. Yeah, <laughs> extremely hashtag cottagecore. Like, She's it got like me of the pictures of like um, Marie Antoinette pretending to be a, a farmer. Mm, it's like she's wearing this, you know, lovely gauzy bonnet and <laughs> like flouncy dress um, and a nice red petticoat, it looks like. Um, yeah, so I just kind of wanted to explore, you know, maybe why this is. Um, why is the milkmaid uh, such an 
attractive figure in like poetry and art and stuff and um uh, there's quite a few folk songs uh traditional folk songs about the milkmaid as well um so for example uh there is an irish folk song i came across called the pretty maid milking the cow and it was on a fine summer's morning of course <laughs> as many of yeah, these these things song. are <laughs> unless it was uh one morning in may which you know is the other option mm -hmm. uh and fine. the the singer um is enamored with this beautiful young girl that he's met who's milking her cow and uh he's trying to you know get her to um to come and, and be with him and um she tells him to go away essentially <laughs> And one of one of the lines is she says, I like to live single and airy till more of the world I do see. Which, you know, I support this milkmaid. <laughs> yeah, and um, that, that does kind of remind me of the one I mentioned, which I was wrong, isn't because of Jenna, it's just connected because he noticed that they didn't get smallpox so they had pretty faces. Um, hmm. Yeah, um... The, the most well-known line from it is, um, what is your fortune, my pretty maid? My face is my fortune, sir, she said. Ah, okay, yeah, that, that leads me nicely to the next song, because, um, I mean, this one, she says that she doesn't want to marry him, and then he goes a bit bitter and is like, oh, well, you know, soon you'll be old and, and not hot. And... <laughs> Trump? <laughs> now he really sounds like married material. I know, yeah, it's not not really helping the case anyway. Like, I don't, I don't think he gets the girl in that song, which um, <laughs> I'm quite pleased about, to be honest. Um, and then there's various versions of a song called "Rolling in the Dew" or the Milkmaid's Song. Um, I think I can which... guess what that's about from the title. You can indeed. Um... <laughs> It's that like there's so many versions of this. Some of them are more suggestive than others. Um, one of them was recorded by Shirley Collins, who's a wonderful folk singer, um, local to me as well. Um, was involved in the the uh, sort of folk revival in London in the fifties. Um, uh, anyway, so one of the refrains in this song is, "It's dabbling in the dew makes the milkmaids fair," which again, you know, related to oh, milkmaids are pretty, and you know. They 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 use the morning dew to wash. <laughs> it's funny because I have heard of that before as being like a beauty treatment. Yeah, I've definitely heard of like washing in the morning dew as uh, almost sort of ritual thing. Mm. Um. Yeah, so there's this whole thing about you know people being attracted to milkmaids. <laughs> um, and I was looking into to why this might be, and I okay, sort of came across a few reasons. So I was, um, this kind of came about as well because I was looking through, I have the book from the Tudor Monastery Farm series. Oh, nice. Um, which is, is a good book. And um, they talk about the dairy has to be very clean um, because any sort of bacteria or anything can totally ruin your cheese or your butter or whatever and i mean if a dairy product's off you know yeah there's no ambiguity about it so um the the temperature had to be regulated like it couldn't get too hot or too cold in there and um it would have to be very very clean apparently the traditional way to clean a dairy was to clean it with salt and boiling water um, yeah, I mean, that's which will... kill a lot of stuff. Yep. Um, not soap. Interestingly, apparently, no soap was used because it would leave a trace in the flavor of the dairy product. Sure. Um. Yeah. So just um, your kind of standard cleaning things, really, because anything else would, like, you you could taste it in the final product. Um, so the dairy maid would have to be very clean and have quite cold hands as well, apparently, for things like um, producing the butter uh, in squeezing out the last of the buttermilk and stuff. 
Mm-hmm. Um, apparently, Isabella Beaton wrote that there is no uh, machinery that is equal to a woman's hand in preparing the butter. Um, so yeah, very clean, cold hands. Um, apparently, um, some dairies would have a would divert like part of a stream to flow through the dairy, which would keep it cool in summer. Which provides is... fresh water as well. Yeah, really interesting. Apparently, some um, older dairies in Devon still have this. That's very cool. Yeah. <laughs> But if you're not familiar with um, the sort of things about the UK, Devon is quite famous for its cream and butter and stuff. Yes, we we talked about clotted cream in our local larder. Go go um, listen to that one. Yeah, we did. Um, and yeah, yeah, the one about scones was it as well? Um, I think the local larder was just clotted cream. Okay. Um. What? Well, yeah. Thing, so... we'll look up where this is. <laughs> So I think I think maybe that's part of it, like comparative to maybe other professions, like you had to be very neat. Um and I, I, 14. Uh, I think that would be, you know, especially when we're talking about later centuries looking back on, you know, a more idealized rural time, like post industrial societies looking back. Mm-hmm. I think that probably would be something that they would would pick out as being an attractive thing like being very clean and and neat and um you know cool hands and stuff and uh, and then also i did come across the cowpox thing so there yeah. was one of the reasons that edward jenner inventor of the smallpox vaccine um like came up with the idea is because there was this local legend that dairy maids never got smallpox and they were protected by some mystical force. Um, so, yeah, do, do you want to tell us the rhyme? Um, well, I, I was mistaken in thinking that the My Face is My Fortune thing okay. was, was, yeah, apparently that poem's actually Tudor. Ah. Um, but I mean, me- medical history is my thing. If you, if you <laughs> want to say it anyway, yeah. Um, so yeah. So when you get cowpox, which is very easy to get when you're handling cows odors all day, mm-hmm. um, and does not scar as a general rule, you get antibodies that can also protect you from smallpox. And he, you know, without knowing about antibodies pretty much figured this out and inoculated a local boy with cowpox you know with with permission of and payment to his mother oh and well then, that makes it okay <laughs> it was the 1700s <laughs> um and then inoculated him with smallpox and he didn't develop smallpox mm-hmm. before before he figured out oh we can before they figured out we can give people a very very small amount of smallpox which was a thing that p- some people were already doing oh right like, well we can give them cowpox and then rather than getting mild smallpox and still potentially being scarred we give them cowpox instead that makes sense i mean which if he would a vaccine it, it makes sense that like he wouldn't be the only one to notice that people who got cowpox did not get smallpox okay. like it seems a fairly easy connection to make. I mean, as you said, it's it became like a folkloric thing. <laughs> yeah. But that's why it's called vaccine, because it comes from the Latin for cow. Oh, right. I didn't know that. That is amazing. <gasps> so we owe cows a lot more than we thought. We really do. Wow. So, yeah, there's another thing, like you said, um, (laughs) the less likely to have smallpox scars than, you know, relatively someone else might be. (laughs) (laughs) Like, less relevant, but also handy. (laughs) Um, So, yeah, I I think that's one thing that went into it. Um, 
one thing that I found interesting while looking at this from the book as well is that um, sheep's cheese was also a big thing in Tudor times, um, which makes sense considering how profitable the wool trade was at the time, and particularly in Britain, there were a lot of sheep. So, like, it's going to be a substantial amount of sheep's milk that you might as well use to get another product. Um, So apparently that was seasonal with, you know, obviously just after lambing season, the milking season would begin. Um, And then you would get these sheep's cheeses, which I have had sheep's cheese, and it's very nice. Um, It's, yeah, kind of a bit bit salty tasting, I think. Um, Have you ever tried it? Um, yeah, I mean, I've, I've had, I've had sheep cheese. I don't, I don't think I've had any particular, beyond stuff like Manchego and, Pec- and Pecorino, but I am, I have to imagine it's similar. Mm-hmm. Yeah, I don't think I've, like, tasted enough cheeses to really compare, like, I'm not, I'm not really a cheese connoisseur. But I like it. <laughs> it is nice. <laughs> but it's just beyond those two, it's harder to get hold of sheep cheese these days, I think. Mm-hmm. Yeah, maybe maybe it's more... Like, I feel like with Europe having such a plethora of cheeses, like regional cheeses, um, we don't have as much variety in the UK, I think. Um, although it's coming back. I think we have a lot of variety. It's just almost all cow cheese. Mm. Yeah. And a little bit of goat. It's a little goat as a treat. <laughs> uh, I also was reading about alternative rennets um, that were used in the past. So uh, rennet, if you've not come across it, is an enzyme from the stomach of a... A young calf that hasn't been weaned um, or a, a lamb um, that is used to like turn milk into cheese essentially mm-hmm. and that was like the main method was like the most effective method um, but obviously it can be quite difficult to get you know some people don't want to slaughter their young animals because you know, might need them um, so there were some like alternative things that that were used and some of one of them is stinging nettles um and also sorrel and goose grass so apparently they do work but not as well as rennet which is why that continued to be the most popular method um but yeah i found that quite interesting it'd be yeah i'd like to try i mean i've never tried cheese making but I think we. D- <laughs> this is something that is an effect of looking into a lot of interesting stuff for this podcast is that we end up wanting to try all of it, right? Yeah. <laughs> um. So maybe I'll try cheese making one day and and try out stinging nettles. <laughs> I was just thinking though, with the whole milkmaids are. Uh... Uh, attractive temptresses doesn't mm-hmm. Tess of the D'Urbervilles work as a milkmaid for a while yes Tess is a dairy maid like not at the start of the book when the event happens mm-hmm. but she does become a, a milkmaid mm. yeah and I think that's that's very symbolic as well mm. um, you know I, I think because of all the cleanliness part of it is that they're symbolic of like purity as well in a way yeah it's um, kind of a weird thing where like they're you know like you said they are temptresses these beautiful unattainable women hmm. who will have have their way with you in the morning dew <laughs> but are also clean and pure uh, yeah, there's there is kind of a a double meaning about it. Um, I mean, in this this um, dabbling in the dew song as well, one of the versions is like 
somebody who's going to who the milkmaid is trying to get to come and sleep with her um and is sounding reluctant but i don't think actually is because it's a folk song um mm -hmm. yeah i don't know <laughs> but then in some of them like the milkmaid is refusing and then in some of them it's like ah oh, but she is actually doing the seduction and yeah it's, it's all a bit um nebulous so <laughs> that is that is definitely a point to make i think well i was gonna say it it can be about um the post-industrial society idealizing the rural past but also some of these songs are really old and this image of the you know pure milkmaid is is very old as well i think um mm. yeah so i i don't know if that might have something to do with um dairying traditionally being like a woman's job um because you well, apparently, uh, women were favoured for milking the animals because, like, they were more gentle and like able to to do it better and you know get in there. Um, and then also having cold hands and like delicate work and that kind of thing. Um, because dairying is very like precise. Um, and in fact, apparently, um. Dairying, like, was kind of quite a science, um, and the dairy maid would would kind of know a lot about, like, without necessarily knowing precisely why everything worked. Like, oh, this is an enzyme, but like, they would know how to get rid of bacteria, and you know, at what temperature is the best for making butter. Or that kind they of were, thing. They were chemists. Um. Yeah. Yeah. Essentially. Um. I do wonder how much of it is the classic thing of, well, women are really good at this and mm -hmm. help make women money. Therefore, if she does it, she's a slut because mm -hmm. she doesn't necessarily need a man, and that's <laughs> that's dangerous. That is that is what the dairy maid says in that song, isn't it? I I'd like to live single and airy. <laughs> so maybe again, yeah, the dairy maid um like has specialist knowledge and is employable because of that. And maybe has a bit more choice in, you know, she can get hired pretty much anywhere she goes because of that knowledge. There's also uh, a lot of sort of witchcraft folklore related to dairying. Um, so things about churning the butter, and if the butter won't come, then it's been witched. Some oh no. someone is to blame. <laughs> yeah, um, and there was there was a bit of folklore that I found that um, thrusting a red hot poker into a bucket of cream would help it to turn into butter. <laughs> I mean, apparently the temperature has an effect, so maybe that helps. I don't know. It's just um, a weird, weird way to heat it up, I guess. Yeah. <laughs> apparently, um, there's a lot of things that have the impact, have an impact on like whether or not the cream will will change into butter through the churning process, and like they found that out kind of later on. Um. But all of these things. Well, when you, you know, say they. Uh, but uh, yeah, I don't know people who do science and things. I don't know. <laughs> um, it it was discovered um, more towards the early twentieth century, like why a lot of these things happen, and and um, so you know it wasn't witchcraft, but you know if the button didn't come back in the day, it was probably witchcraft. I'm just thinking about Tiffany aching. 
the the Discworld character because she's she's a cheesemaker and a witch, and I'm yeah. I'm convinced Pratchett did that on purpose. That he, <laughs> he, he did stuff like that. I wouldn't be surprised. That would be amazing. But also something that I like is that I think it is heavily implied that Tiffany being good at making cheese is not because she's a witch. It's just because she's smart and observes, you know, what's best for making cheese. Mm. Which I like. Just because you know how it's done doesn't mean it isn't magic. (laughs) Yeah. What Granny Weatherwax says. I love so much of the the shepherding folklore in the Tiffany Aching series as well. Like the thing about shepherds being buried with a a small piece of wool pinned to their jacket so that, you know, that that's their uh, explanation for why they didn't go to church all the time. Oh yeah, because that's a real thing, thoughts. isn't it? It's a real thing, yeah. Yeah, it is it's documented, so... I just love that detail a lot. Um, and, and the bit about the shepherding hut on the, the hillside. Um, there's a, a museum close-ish to me. Well, it's not exactly a museum. It's a sort of country, like sort of national park, countryside centre. But they've got some a couple of old um, shepherding huts from the 19th century. And Oh, that's cool. Yeah, the, it's, it's really interesting to just have a look at. Um, these big iron wheels on them. Uh, so yeah, ending up on a little bit of a, a tangent there, but um, yeah, I just kind of wanted to have a little exploration into the character of the dairy maid, and, um, the reality and the sort of legend surrounding her. Um, because I just I think it's quite an interesting figure, um, mm. and interesting one to pick to idealize as well um and it it was interesting to look into the um actual you know what a dairy maid dealt with and what she had to do and what she had to know in order to be a good dairy maid and it's actually quite a lot um there's a lot of knowledge and you know that would make them a valuable person to have working for you No, that was that was really cool. Yeah. So yeah, I don't I don't know whether also it might be connected to having that special knowledge, you know, and like, oh, this is a a person who knows things, <laughs> secrets, <laughs> lady secrets. Oh no, you were found. <laughs> Which might also have something to do with it being associated with the folklore and, and the magic and stuff as well. I don't know. Um, yeah. Yeah. So perhaps a little bit shorter than our usual today, but um, what do we have for the local larder? Hello, I'm Mod Pencil from Probably Bad RPG Ideas. If you'd like to hear discussions of ideas such as what if in my urban fantasy game magic turns out to not be real? And what is the best rules for an ogre? Then listen to the Probably Bad podcast, which is available on everywhere podcasts are and also YouTube. Or check out our Tumblr and Twitter. So what we have is um, what's known in Thai as uh, Kai Mot Dang or Ant Eggs. Ooh. Okay, what what do you do with them? Um well in Thailand and Laos especially, but also other places in Southeast Asia, you eat them. Okay. Um yeah, it's the eggs and pupae of uh weaver ants specifically. Okay. Why are they called weaver ants? Do they do they weave things? Uh, they use silk to sort of weave leaf- leaves together to make nests. Oh wow! 
They're they're really cool. Yeah, like, that's that's really cool, cool. But weaver ants are really cool. <laughs> they they work together to pull the leaves together and then sew them together with um, larval silk, like the same silk that you would use to make a pupa. Oh wow! Is that like spider silk? Um, I have not been able to find much information on the properties of larval silk, mm -hmm. sadly. At some point, we'll probably do a silk episode and then we can talk about it then. Yeah. Okay, wow. Um, so like, what, what, what way do you eat the ants' eggs? So, there's one really popular way of doing it in Laos is ant egg soup. Um, Kenkai Mod Som, I, I believe, in, um, in Laoshan, which is, um, yeah, the, the juice of a citrus plant, various ones are used, uh, shallots, peppers, fermented fish, and leaves like gooseberry. Okay. And then you boil all that up together. Ah. Cool. Um, I've never heard of or that. Or you can have it in a um, in a spiced salad. It's very popular in Thailand. Hmm. But because they because they create acetic acid, which is um, basically what makes vinegar taste like vinegar. Oh, okay. You don't <laughs> so necessarily like... have to dress the salad. <laughs> That's the spice. Which I think is quite cool. Oh, interesting. Are they like basically nutritious or anything? They are. Um, 8.2 grams of protein per 100 grams, which is oh, wow. very okay. high. I mean, yeah, that makes sense. If If the thing has a lot of protein, eat the thing. But also a lot less fat than things like eggs, which ah. has, is, is kind of a similar level of protein. Well, when I say eggs, chicken eggs, these mm -hmm. are also eggs. <laughs> yeah. Um, they're also a good source of B vitamins and various minerals. All right. Including niacin, which is cool. What does that do, particularly? Um... Well, niacin is a thing that, um, so pellagra is a disease where you're short on niacin. Oh, okay. I have um, heard of pellagra. Yeah, you can, you can get it a lot in a lot of developing countries. Mm -hmm. So the fact is... that there's a lot of niacin in ant eggs is very cool. Is that related to, like, the vampire legends? Like, I've heard it to do with that um i don't know okay I, mean, I, haven't, I haven't heard that but that doesn't mean that it isn't i'm sure i've heard pellagra in conjunction with like some kind of old monster legends with like oh it could actually have been pellagra um no no i'll look into that for a future podcast <laughs> mm. it, it does make you more sensitive to the sun apparently oh, okay um, but yeah, it's it's kind of dying off as a thing to eat now, ant eggs. Okay. Um, which is a shame because it sounds like it's a really cheap source of protein. Yeah. You can, you can farm ant, this kind of ant in places where you're already farming for food, like um, on mango trees or palm. Oh, right. And you, you just give them extra food and sugar water so they don't go elsewhere. And then you okay. can crack the crack the nests open and get hold of the eggs. Oh, gosh. <laughs> that sounds like a job. Um, but they do it in a way that doesn't harm the adult ants. Okay. So you can reuse the same, the same ants. <laughs> reusable ants. Yeah. <laughs> Everyone loves reusable ants. Yeah. Um, okay. yeah, it's, it's kind of dying off as a thing now, um, partly because it's seen as sort of a country bumpkin kind of thing. 
-hmm. and also because of western influence making people less willing to eat things that we would see as odd such as insects Mm -hmm. but I don't know I think this sounds cool yeah I can definitely see like why you would eat it it sounds nutritious it sounds um, like this and quite tasty. <laughs> like a, the, I saw one thing saying about putting them in omelets, and I feel like that would be a really nice. Oh yeah. Like there's wow. already a lot of protein in an omelet, but you'd have even more, and then that sort of um, sourness to it, mm-hmm. I think, would be really interesting. Hmm. It is. It is interesting how your upbringing and your like you know cultural biases. Um, affect how you think about different things isn't it because like that is when I first heard you say ant eggs my first reaction was like oh gosh that's that's very different to what I would consider eating um even though you know like my I know that like things like caviar for example is really a really prestigious food in Europe and that's fish eggs like Mm. it's the same thing but um yeah it's 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 just interesting thinking about that um i would definitely try it though yeah it's it sounds quite tasty hmm yeah that's that's my my brief local order for this week that was a good one i liked that it was like informative on many levels <laughs> <laughs> i know a new kind of ant yeah weave rats are cool <laughs> i'm, I'm gonna like, go and, any that. animal that weaves is very cool like weaver birds yeah. as well yeah they like, properly like sew the leaves together it's wild oh wow that's pretty cool okay i'm gonna, I'm gonna go look that <laughs> up <laughs> um so yeah we I hope you enjoyed the podcast. If you want to support us, we are on Patreon as Bread and Thread. You can get access to monthly recipes and a Discord server where we, we just chat about food and crafts and things. We are also on Twitter, um, Bread and Thread as well, where you can find um, pictures and things that we talk about in the episodes. You can find teasers for upcoming episodes, any news and things. And we are uh, on YouTube also bread and thread keeping our branding going yeah we're uh, up- uploading old episodes to YouTube once we catch up we will also be uploading new episodes to YouTube okay. <laughs> is there anything else we haven't mentioned uh, we're also Tumblr? on Tumblr Tumblr also at bread and thread which is all all the same stuff as on the Twitter um, yeah, I... more interaction just because we're both on Tumblr a lot more than we're on <laughs> Twitter I think yeah um, I'd say so if, if you want to say hi or request an episode or a local order or anything like that you can email breadandthreadpodcast at gmail.com and I think that's everything In that case, uh, we will see you next time for more social history facts. Yeah, I've got a a good episode lined up for spooky season. Excellent. Can't wait.